Coming up on Digital Music Trends episode 172 on the 26th of February 2014, the deal between Warner and Shazam, Sony Music sued by American Idol's label, the new YouTube playlist functionality, Songcoin, Sound Focus and wearables. DMT's coverage is brought to you by CI, the delivery platform used by leading independent labels, distributors and aggregators around the world on ci-info.com. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, I'm Andrea Leonelli and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry and DMT is available as an audio and video show on a variety of channels including the iTunes Store, SoundCloud, Mixcloud and many more. To get in touch with the show you can tweet us on at Trends or email contact at digitalmusictrends.com. Your feedback and word of mouth and circulating the show is uh, super important so make sure that if you enjoy the podcast uh, you drop us a tweet or share it with your network. And and as you've seen in the intro, this week's podcast was sponsored by CI, who sponsored DMT's coverage of Medem and this week's shows, uh, and this month's shows, actually. So they're the leading provider of digital delivery services to the independent community, so go check them out on ci-info.com. I really appreciate their support keeping the show going. And you can see that I have big headphones on today if you're watching the video version. I'm actually uh, terrified that something's going to go wrong because I'm using the new Wirecast setup, and uh, it's a real pleasure to have uh, on this first uh, edition of uh, DMT. So of live encoded uh, uh, two great guests uh, so Elliot van Boskirke uh, joining me uh, once more from evolver.fm so hi Elliot how's things hi Andrea things are things are great things are cold though I know I can, I can see you're you're all uh, cuddled up in a jacket so uh, thankfully in London it's essentially springtime all the trees are in bloom and everything's fine so <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> I feel quite privileged about that. And uh, and yeah, so, uh, oh, sorry, okay, great. Yes, I need to learn a few tricks here <laughs> and just make sure that things work properly. Uh, and uh, the second guest of today's show is uh, Jay Cole from Nashville. So hi, Jay, and thanks for joining me uh, from, sure. from uh, Music Geek Services. So what do you guys do? Well, uh, we are a, uh, for lack of a better term, we are a fan engagement and direct-to-fan uh, sales and marketing company, and we work directly with uh, mostly independent artists. Um, our forte kind of seems to be legacy acts of recent, uh, so bands like the President's United States of America, Jars of Clay, uh, Sloan, um, and a bunch of other bands uh, longer in their career and looking at digital strategy and fan engagement. So the last piece of it is we've kind of evolved over time into much more of a a digital strategist uh, entity too, which has been which has been awesome. So thanks for having us today. That's great. That's awesome. And of course, uh, going back to Elliot, if you haven't come across Evolver.fm, it's a great resource for digital music and uh, music tech stories, and also a lot of coverage that is sort of off the beaten path. So stuff that you might not find you know, on other sites. So definitely worth uh, taking a look of uh, at what they are covering uh, right now. And uh, I want to open this week's show by talking about the deal between Warner and Shazam, which was announced at the tail end of last week and generated quite a bit. Of of uh, uh, commentary online. So what happened is that Warner has entered into a strategic collaboration with Shazam to access the company's data and use it to find and eventually sign some new up and up and coming acts. So the twist is that Warner is going to be uh, signing these new acts under a Shazam branded label. So Shazam here is going to get actually a share of uh, the splits, which is a uh, uh, you know a pretty unprecedented deal. Uh, unprecedented deal, and uh, uh, of course we don't know the details on what the splits are going to be. I wouldn't imagine that it would be particularly significant but definitely uh, an interesting step from Warner. So this is big news and it's uh, very interesting because it puts uh, Warner at the bleeding edge of discovery in terms of putting their money where their mouth is. So Elliot, do you think this can really work and, and why do you think Warner felt compelled to do this? Well, um, Shazam, I met with, with uh, I'm blanking on the guy's name, but um, someone who definitely works at Shazam uh, told <laughs> me a pretty amazing statistic that they generate uh, one-tenth of global digital music sales. Right. Which is amazing. I mean, so this is one app. Um, people are identifying a song, and then they're buying a song, and that is 10% of the global like sales uh, market. And and they're hooked into subscription apps too. So I think Shazam, you know, they're 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 large. That's that's a lot of uh, that's a lot of the market. Um, and they've also the other thing that's impressed me for years. You know, they've been sending over lists. You know, based on people's tags, we think these these artists are going to be big next year. Right. You know, they've been sending out a list. And so I'd imagine uh, that that's 
probably what Warner is going to get to look at first or this new Warner Shazam hybrid. Um, so I like that part of it. Um, you know, like you, I'm, I'm not sure how much, you know, how the money thing is working, um, you know, because this is a list that Shazam has been sending to me for free. <laughs> so I don't know. And I, I haven't managed to make a huge business out of that list. Um, not that I was, <laughs> I'm the artist, but if, you know, uh, but, but, you know, I don't want to gloss over the fact that they have access to a lot of data and they're, and they're large and, and uh, that, that's. Yeah. And I, I it's kind of, a, I think it's interesting to, if you look at, uh, for example, uh, something like uh, uh, localized uh, uh, discovery as well of, of, of Shazamming of tracks. So if you say that the label wants to sign more acts that are sort of hipster acts from Shoreditch here in London and they can, narrow down the shazamming of tracks that goes on in that area and around the venues in that area then that makes it an interesting proposition to sort of look at micro trends for example that could uh, uh, bleed into into macro trends uh, uh, jay do you think that's that might be something that they they're going to look at as well yeah and i mean it also it strikes me as exactly what you said there's localized so i don't know in terms of just because there's that data coming in and i've never seen the list that elliot's speaking of but I mean, you're, you're, they are sucking so much data in from people. And I know in Nashville, someone, you know, Shazam in a track versus somebody in London, chances are they, they may not be the same track. Um, if it connects, that's awesome. But then what is Warner going to have to do with that is, is look at all these people. That's a lot. I mean, I guess, you know, from an A&R perspective, they're doing the, the front end work. Yeah. But, but there's still the back end work, which becomes cumbersome. And then that becomes where's the money? Um, and my biggest thing that I see, uh, at, you know, at face value, I think Shazam is a great brand name. So from a consumer level, I think, you know, the fans would be used to seeing that and they might think, oh, people are discovering this. So therefore, I might pay attention to it. Right. But to me, it's all it's after the fact. Think about it. If someone like you just said, Elliot, if someone Shazams it and then they like the song and they buy it, transactions already happen. So Warner was just kind of chasing after an ambulance if they're a lawyer. You know, it's like they're they're running after him and saying, oh, I, I want to sign you. It's like, well, that band's already been purchased. So where's where's the money going to come from Warner's? Yeah. They would have to then make another track or then have an EP or an album that's worthy of it. And in, in that kind of process, in that sales transaction, it's so instantaneous. Yeah. I don't know if that follow-up is going to be there. So. This is true. This is true. I mean, by the time somebody is tagging it, that's a great point. It's like they're going to have to react so fast um, in order to capitalize on this. And I think this, you know, it speaks to basically the underlying issue here, which is there's so much data um, mm. available um, in so many places. And then how to make that into something that, that you can take action with is another question. So we'll see. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's an interesting deal. I mean, I, I, I'm interested in seeing or whether uh, I've also heard uh, from somebody else that you know they thought that uh, this could also be a way for Warner to put itself on the map, uh, given the lack of of its presence on Vivo, for example, uh, which sort of restricts uh, a bit its its digital operations. Although this is more on the discovery phase, so I'm not sure whether that that uh, sort of uh, parallel uh, adds up. Uh, but it's definitely interesting to see Warner pursue different avenues because they have sort of this standoff on the on the Vivo thing, and they they have to create their own multi-channel network as well. So. Uh, definitely something to keep an eye on and uh, from an interesting deal to legal matters a couple of uh, stories uh, uh, on the legal front and first of all we talk about Sony Music as it has been sued by 19 Recordings which is the company behind American Idol uh, as reported by Ben Cesario at the New York Times and 19 Recordings seeks 10 million dollars in damages over underpaid uh, royalties for artists like Kelly Clarkson Carrie Underwood Chris Daughtry and others so the suit says that Sony improperly characterized plays on streaming services as sales or distribution rather than as broadcasts or transmissions. So this is an argument that kind of recalls a little bit what was uh, done uh, during the Eminem uh, uh, lawsuit against Universal, which Eminem won. Although in that case, the contract, the wording of the contract was really uh, what won the case for Eminem uh, in that particular front. So uh, according to the suit, uh, broadcasts or transmissions from streaming are entitled to a royalty rate of 50% of Sony's net receipts, uh, which uh, an artist, of course, were only paid the standard sales royalty, which is much lower, which is between between 10 and 20 percent tops. So um, there were also a few other allegations made against Sony that the company made improper deductions uh, against the advertising and stuff like that. So this is an interesting suit, but it's just another one that builds on top of others that have happened in the past. Uh, do you think that, uh, uh, Jay, do you think the labels are going to start uh, worrying about a mounting amount of lawsuits from artists that are seeking for those uh, uh, streaming uh, streaming royalties to be accounted for as essentially sinks or you know as uh, as it says here broadcast transmissions uh, right. uh, which uh, grant them a much higher uh, percentage rate on, on royalties 
Absolutely. I, I mean, I think at the, at the core of this, you got to look at the reality of it. The reality of it is, you know, the way that these uh, deals are structured with the label and the artist, it, you know, someone like Eminem, when he was signed, there's no way that they were even thinking about the, the Spotify's of the world or the Beats music here in the States. They weren't thinking of that. Right. Um, so, so reality is now these, these contracts, which are true, valid contracts, have to be abided by. Um, and I think it's, you know, at first, at face value, I think I've already heard people within my group of friends saying, oh, these are, you know, greedy musicians. I said, no, that not at all. I mean, a lot of times, the, I, I also teach um, digital marketing for the Berkeley School of Music um, online, and I have to impart on these students that are taking it that, you know, the streaming revenue is completely different from a, from a download and a, and a physical purchase of it. And therefore, we always, in this class, we always talk about the, the minute money that's made by these artists over time and that just signing to a major label doesn't equate to a lot of revenue. And yes, for a mega star, especially on these, you know, 19, for the, the American idols, um, you know, usually those equate to multi-million units or at least downloads of a song. But yeah, now that streaming picks up, absolutely these labels should be shaking in their boots for looking at those contracts. Um, but I also kind of say, for years and years and years, these labels were making tons of money from it too. So, you know, I, the the bands that I consult with, I, I'm not going to lie. Every single one of them has had a major label deal, and every single one of them has happily left their major label deal. And right. this is the conversation that has come up because they have feel they felt uh, that they don't negate that their time on the majors wasn't great for exposure and great for this. They also bemoan the fact that there was money that they they'll never see, money that was wasted. Um, so I think this is kind of a writing of the ship on a lot of on a lot of ways. Um, and I could see labels crying foul and, and complaining about it, but it really is a tit for tat. And I, yeah. I hate to say that, but that's my gut. So. And Elliot, uh, New York is becoming sort of a, 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 a lawsuit central when it comes to music industry. It seems like almost every lawsuit that happens in this space is filed in New York. Do, do you know why that is? <laughs> I don't, and I should. I used to be a paralegal <laughs> in New York City, so I spent a lot of time at both of the main courthouses downtown. Uh, yeah, I don't. I mean, that's where the a lot of the majors are located. Of course, it's my yeah. best get. You know, they have offices there. I mean, and in L.A., obviously, in Nashville. Um, so, yeah, that's that's a very good question. I, my reaction to this whole thing was like, you know, I I do feel that iTunes downloads our sales and that streams our distribution. I mean, you know, th that's just how it seems to me. I I don't know why they're paying for ads. I mean, right. Jay's a lot closer to this one than I am, so so he's I like his answer. But that was the part that really stood out to me. Like, why are there these deductions for advertising the show? Like, yeah. what is that? Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. At the very least, that, that doesn't pass the smell test for me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and this is uh, just uh, the second lawsuit in a week. You know, there was a settlement from Warner Music Group last week, uh, which was uh, uh, done over a class uh, lawsuit, which was a completely different case, of course. Uh, it was a class uh, uh, class action lawsuit brought by artists uh, over the royalty calculation for downloads and ringtones. So that was about downloads, actually. Uh, and the settlement was uh, $11 million. We didn't actually manage to talk about it in last week's show, but it was in the lineup. And uh, uh, artists that stand to benefit are those uh, due to receive royalties from contracts dated up to the 31st of December 2002. So uh, here another high profile case of a settlement uh, of a label uh, on digital royalties that were uh, uh, either improperly accounted for or where the artists felt they hadn't received enough uh, uh, enough uh, uh, percentages uh, on, on the on the incomes made from from the labels. So uh, definitely uh, something to keep an eye on and uh, uh, I, I don't know I was just thinking uh, I asked you a little about the location because I know that sometimes in the US it's practice to file a suit in the state where you're most likely to win <laughs> so <laughs> it's I true <laughs> um I don't that could that. be that could be part of it right shopping what are they there's something shopping jury shopping something like that um yeah, exactly and and yeah that does happen uh but like, you know, of course, that, yeah. that's probably more the domain of massive oil companies that actually have the money to go and do a lawsuit in tax Texas or somewhere where they're, you know, there might be judges that are more attuned to their cause than. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's interesting, I, I did want to add, what I find interesting is, is to me, this there's kind of two things that differentiate the, the lawsuits. You know, the one that was talked about, the Universal Music Group one uh, in, in the article that you passed around, it, you know. One thing that shocks most of the people that I talk to, that they really, and I agree with you, I, iTunes to me is sales, but legally iTunes is a license, it's, it's, which shocks most people because they say, wait a second, I paid $1.29 for that song, I've downloaded it, I could do whatever I want with it. And I said, yes, technically you can, but legally, if you read the iTunes agreement, you are licensing that song from iTunes. You technically 
could at any given time, if iTunes wanted to, and Apple came back and said, we're taking it all back, you have no legal st st you know, ground to stand on, which is a right. shock. But I, but I think what, in my heart, what, what we're seeing is the lawsuit now that's going out about streaming services, that to me, that's a true license. So I think what needs to happen is there has to be a, re my, my gut is there should be a revision in the iTunes language that says that those downloads are truly sales. Yeah. Um, so, th so that the labels, the labels should be, in my mind, the labels should be paying artists for sales on those downloads. And then all the other things, all the, the, the Pandoras and the Spotify's of the world, to me, you know, those are, those are streaming services. Those are licenses. But I, so I think it's a bigger legal mess that we're looking at because now the courts have to then discuss iTunes for download, permanent downloads versus streaming. And now it's going to even get more blurred. So it's yeah. gonna, I think it's going to be a mess for a good couple of years. Yeah. It's going to be a fun one. Uh, well, yeah. it's going to keep the show going anyway, so that's, that's always good, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. And so, uh, and uh, I wanted to talk uh, quickly about YouTube. So, uh, YouTube implemented some changes to its playlists, uh, which uh, are uh, certainly of interest to anybody working in the music industry because of, uh, you know, uh, the importance of YouTube for music. And CNET reports that the changes rolling out to all YouTube visitors over the next few days make the YouTube site more closely resemble its mobile app. So, the interface is now central aligned as a prominent, has a pr prominent guide, three lined icon next to the site logo which has a, a subscriptions and playlists at the center of the screen uh, in, a, uh, in addition playlists that you've created uh, those from other YouTube users that you've liked are now listed in your guide and personal playlists now have a better editing screen so uh, a bunch of things now also uh, clicking the like button next to your favorite musicians favorite video playlists will add that playlist to your collection as well so it's a bunch of little things that are happening here but I think they're pretty interesting because uh, YouTube playlists in a way have slightly been overlooked uh, so far. People usually go there as a one-off destination to listen to one track and there's only a certain segment of a teenager perhaps that, that use playlists as a way to actually listen to a whole album or a whole compilation uh, in one go. So uh, Elliot, do you think that this is, this is a significant change uh, for playlisting and, and do you think that there is more to exploit in, in, in that part of YouTube that hasn't been done yet? I absolutely do. I mean, I've, I've even written a tutorial before they made this change on how to use YouTube like a music service because they didn't have it set up that way. And uh, it is a music service. I mean, it's the largest on-demand music streaming service in the world by right. a long shot. So, I mean, in terms of distribution, not in terms of revenue or anything. Anyway, um, so this this takes them a little bit closer to being a music service. And given that they've said that that's what they want to do, um, I think this is a stepping stone towards, you know, an actual paid ad-free YouTube um, service. And, you know, the funny thing to me was the, the quote from um, the YouTube guy originally when that story came out about them launching a service. And he said something like, you know, our content partners are very eager for us to do this. Right. Um, so it's not, this is not something that Google woke up and said, hey, let's turn YouTube into a music service. That'd be fun. Um, I think it's dependent on the licensing. You know, they, they've got to have a paid version if they want to keep the ball rolling with the licensing. And maybe even these playlists are part of that overall agreement. You know, like, the, you know, the, maybe the labels are saying your, your license doesn't allow for prominent playlists or, or there's, you know, something like that. I, I, this is pure speculation, but one way or the other, I see it as a step towards this YouTube music service. Absolutely. Uh, Jay, a good, a good point from Elliot to talking about how this could be a stepping stone towards the release of a music service. Do you agree? Oh, absolutely. Um, I'm not going to lie. I mean, I have a 12-year-old and a 9-year-old daughter, and I would say every weekend they're sitting on either my wife's iPad or they're sitting on my computer and they're watching videos. And when I, they're not actually watching the videos, it's because they want to listen to the songs. Nine out of ten times they're just streaming the music and watching the lyrics on a lyric video, but that's the way they are consuming their music. Um, I'm, you know, being the digital guy, trying to introduce them to, like, we're doing the free beats music thing now. We've done RDO and we've done Spotify. Because I'm trying to coach them, but this is actually no different to me because now with this changes, they will get customized to the concept of, oh, we can actually make playlists on YouTube. Because they are the type, like Elliot said, I mean, they're doing one-off searches and they're, and they're kind of digging into it. And I think right. the, labels, the labels are not dumb. They know by sheer drive traffic and the revenue they're making through the back end of, this, of these licensing deals that the eyeballs are there and the mass distribution, as Elliot said, is there. So it's like... This is the best music service that people don't even think of as music service because right now it's completely free. Right. So if they can make if they can make these tweaks um, and get it customized and have people thinking of playlists, then it truly when they do roll out a paid version, then they truly have something to say like Beats, like Spotify, like Pandora. Look what we can do. Um, and the nice thing is, I think what I'm already hearing just from my 
asking around in my classes, you know, people are already online most of the day uh, sitting at a computer. Um, I, I know for a perfect example, someone was telling me they wanted to try Beats, but Beats doesn't have a web-based thing yet. So right. they said, I don't, want to be, I don't want to be tethered to my phone, and I spent $56 when I did that before on Spotify because I ran over on my data when I didn't realize I wasn't on Wi-Fi. And I was like, oh, okay. So this, to me, is an alternative to those sitting at their desks or those young kids that don't have iPhones or smartphones and they're already online on a computer. YouTube could be kind of, you know, I don't, I don't know the word I'm looking for, but it's, it's definitely going to carve it. To me, it's going to carve out its own niche right. of uh, who will consume it as a, as a music streaming service. Yeah, that's that's super interesting yeah. and definitely one to keep an eye on. And of course, for myself as well, as uh, I, uh, DMT has a YouTube channel. If you're listening to the audio show, definitely uh, come and check out our lovely faces uh, on YouTube. <laughs> I don't know how else to sell this. It's, it's, yeah. kind, of, it's kind of difficult, isn't it? <laughs> Speaking of which, I need to hop off just for four seconds. I'm yeah, not sure, leaving, of course. But yeah, I need yeah, to absolutely. do something. I'll be absolutely. right back. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, this is going to be an, an, an interesting one uh, with the show being live of course uh, uh, actually this is okay. a good, uh, it's a, actually a good second now uh, uh, to uh, sorry let me just I want to take a moment actually uh, now to reach out to all the listeners in the US and California especially as I was made aware of a great LA based charity called Pavlov this week uh, whose mm. goal is to fund pediatric cancer research and advances in treatment uh, you know they want to educate and empower cancer families and improve the quality of life for children living with cancer through hospital play music and arts programs so Pavlov was founded in 2008 by the president of Electro Records uh, Jeff Castellas and his wife Joanne uh, it's a, a great project and if you are going to be in or around LA on April the 4th they're organizing their second annual rock and rolls golf tournament to raise funds for the charity so if you are interested go and check out pablov.org slash LA golf for more information it sounds like a great event a great way to contribute to this cause and an awesome day out so it's, it's not bad really and I, I just want to mention that because it sounded like a fantastic project and uh, so I wanted to uh, talk about Elliot uh, a story that is all yours so i'm gonna leave you to explain it essentially it was published yesterday and it's about a new alternative currency called songcoin that wants to be at the bitcoin for music essentially so how did you come about it and uh, what are they aiming to do well this is a this is a weird one and the timing of it is interesting given all of the scandal with bitcoin um but so i i wrote about a company called SeekPod years ago um, when i was at wired and i actually used them to embed playlists and stuff like that and basically it was a playable search engine so you're right. searching much like hype machine you know it's you're searching blogs you know mp3s that are supposed to be on these blogs for the most part and then you you can make playlists out of them and put them on the web. Um, and they were sued very much uh, towards the end and, and uh, sort of <clears throat> went away. Um, the, the founder, Cajun Franks, um, then built this MIMV video thing that's now an app recommender. Um, and he got back in touch to said, to tell me about this uh, song coin thing. So um, I am, uh, I've got my head around Bitcoin. I'm, a, I'm not as, you know, familiar with these other alternative, alternative currencies, right? right. So even beyond Bitcoin, um, but the, the way that Bitcoin, the value rose so quickly and, and was so volatile, it sort of spawned these other alternative currencies. Um, and we've also, of course, had lots of different virtual currencies in Farmville and all these games. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of this going on. And some of these fringe ones, I think the I, I'm confused as to how to pronounce this, but Doge coin, doggy yeah, Doge. coin. Yeah. Dodge. Dodge. It's something that we all just see in print, right? So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so that that shot up to like ten or twenty million dollars worth of those things, um, and it's just it's very weird. So now there's this market where if um, and I'll get to the music part in a second, but yeah, there's sure. this market now where when you launch a new alternative currency, all the people who are speculating on this just kind of jump into it just in case, like they they've got Bitcoin. They probably have gold bars. They, they have some dollars. They've got a few of these Doge coins, whatever. Um, and they're just sort of hedging against themselves everywhere. And so right. um, part of the rationale here is that some of those people are going to jump in and buy Songcoin just because it's there. Yeah. Um, and so Pimovi, which is the new company that, that Franks has, um, which is a subsidiary of a natural gas mining company. So there's a mining connection, the way that people mine for these coins. Yeah. It's actually a natural gas mining company. Uh, <laughs> anyway, just odd connection. Um, so they're going to give away these these song coins for free um, to fans. And so if you're an artist, you can set up a tip jar 
Um, I, I'm getting some feedback. Are you guys hearing that? Is that just me? Nope. No, nope. sorry. Okay. Oh, it went away. Okay. Um, so basically, they're going to give away these free coins and let people tip artists. They're going to build a, a discovery system that lists a bunch of artists, and you can go find them and tip them, or the artist sends you to the page and says, tip me there. Um, and they might just give, they'll just give these coins out in the beginning. Um, and I was like, well, so if I'm an artist, why would I want to accept song coin? And his response to that was like, well, we're doing this. You might get some song coin. Will you accept them? And it's like, well, if, you know, why not? Uh, who knows what's going to happen with this thing? I mean, they're counting on the value rising. Nothing to me is certain, even like if Bitcoin, which is the top one of these things, you know, the, the top exchange of that was was hacked for almost 400 million dollars this week right so uh the, to me the the chances are very much in doubt of you know whether something that's not even the the established player in the market whether people are going to trust it is is uh you know who knows uh, but it's certainly interesting this idea of a, a music oriented currency so you'd be able to you know they want to do a deal with song kick i think where if you use song coin to buy concert tickets you get a deal yeah um and and of course they can reduce the transaction costs associated with buying concert tickets or, or sending money to another label internationally and of course nobody knows how to tax these transactions yet <laughs> um so the idea of this other currency that just is only for music and and can bypass a lot of the uh the the little frictional barriers in in any economy is is kind of interesting yeah uh, whether it'll take off i mean i'm not i'm not converting all my savings into song coin uh <laughs> probably on the first day but um it'll, it's interesting we'll see how it plays out yeah exactly i mean i guess like that the main concern for the music industry is a player of this kind that is specialized in music is the fact that uh these currencies have proven very uh uh immaterial in a sense you know the fluctuations are huge from day from day to day and they're huge for bitcoin you know the the company's gone from you know 1300 to 500 to back to 800 and back down and so uh, i guess because we're talking about microtransactions when you're talking about music industry and something costing a buck or two bucks or, or 10 bucks uh, it becomes a lot more difficult to predict what, how much you're going to earn and how much you actually have in the bank as you know, if you have a bunch of uh, of uh, uh, song coins, I forgot the name already. Uh, song coins, yes, exactly, that's right. And so, uh, that, I guess that could be a primary concern for artists. Uh, uh, you know, for Jay, for you, like in knowing how uh, you know concerned artists are with knowing how much they're earning, especially in these days, uh, do you think that this could be a major issue for them uh, adopting this format? Yeah, I mean, I, I I just see it as to me, and this is just maybe my age. I'm a 45 year old guy. I look, I look at the whole Bitcoin thing, and I still kind of go, "Really? Is is that gonna, you know, is that gonna take off?" And then obviously today, I'm ironically literally getting ready this morning, and NPR has a story about Bitcoin on it, um, or maybe yesterday morning. Um, and it was just one of those things. I'm like, I, this sounds so volatile, and it just sounds so unsure that now they're going to focus on, like you said, an alternative alternative currency, Elliot. And it's yeah. like, oh my gosh, it's it. <laughs> so now, so now you're taking it down to even a more a, a lower level of possibility to me of being secure. So that the bands are probably looking at it and going, why, you know, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll accept it. And then if they don't cash it out or, or hold on to it, it's like they're going to come. I'm sure they're going to in a 12 months time go. What do I do with this now? I, I don't see it as something that, the, that my gut is that those established artists or even for those baby bands that, that need revenue to literally put gas in their van so they could tour, I, I just don't see it as a viable thing to them. Now, that's the band, but as far as labels go and, and the micro concept in the, the, you know, a dollar for a song, you know, I could see the labels, I could see some aggressive, pro progressive labels if it did have some health for a while, say, yeah, we can test this, but then it would be contingent, I think, on the on the actual store in which it was purchased. So is iTunes going to accept it? Chances are they're not going to. So, yeah. you know, it, it's that kind of thing. It's like, it, once again, there's other layers to, before it ever gets to the fans, uh, bands. I don't see the bands opening up their uh, their own stores that accept SongCoin as of yet. Um, I could be totally wrong and be proven to be an old guy uh, in a year's time, but my gut says that it, it, this is just yet something else to take advantage of the rage that is out there for Bitcoin, um, and because it is this alternative currency. And I think you know, I think the digital age is always looking for how to how to move away from traditional uh, life uh, in in the physical world and traditional m transactions of of money. I mean, obviously things are going online, banking. I, I rarely ever carry cash anymore, so in that sense, it makes sense. 
sense, I have a bank card, I, I make my transactions, but that's also still rooted in my actual U.S. dollar. It's not yeah. rooted in some, some make-believe currency. You know? But then again, U.S. dollar is based on the scarcity of gold uh, from the right. Federal Reserve, and uh, we, right. we only sure. agree to the value of gold because uh, collectively we believe sure. that that ha holds monetary value, even though we can't yes. actually do anything with it or eat it or grow crops <laughs> with it. So. <laughs> You bring a very valid point to the table, my friend. Yes, so the exactly. whole, uh, yeah. our whole econo economic system is doomed. But I think it'd be yeah. quite it'd be quite yeah. fun to see this implemented in something like, for example, the uh, BitTorrent bundles. Uh, although yeah. we bring some confusion because the company is called BitTorrent and this is called Songcoin so and not Bitcoin, so it's it's very right. confusing. Mm -hmm. But you know, it'd be qu quite cool because they're, they're now talking about doing some sort of transactional methods to to, to unlock uh, the the second half of the bundle, the one that is uh, sort of behind the uh, the paywall or the information wall, as it is right now. Yeah. So, you know, because uh, Bitcoin is such a worldwide phenomenon, uh, sorry, uh, BitTorrent is such a worldwide phenomenon, and uh, uh, using coins of this type uh, is essentially abolish transactional fees. Uh, it'd be quite interesting to see them adopt one of these currencies as a payment method because it would make it a lot more smooth for consumers and also less costly for artists that are receiving payments on, on, on this end too. Mm -hmm. um, awesome. So. Um, I wanted to talk about a new startup actually, and uh, I don't know if you guys have had time to check it out, but it's called uh, Sound Focus. So it got quite a bit of press last week uh, because it raised $1.7 million with a technology that uh, tunes or rebalances the audio that reaches a listener's ears to match their hearing patterns. So what does that mean? It means that essentially Sound Focus uh, tests your ears. Uh, when you, the, the app is free, so you can download it for iOS right now and try it out. It tests your hearing, it tests whether you can hear certain frequencies or not, and at what level and then it uh, adjusts the EQ essentially of the tracks that you're listening to uh, adding more of what you can't hear very well uh, so that you, you balance out the track instead of just uh, cranking up the volume and reducing your hearing even more I guess that's the end goal uh, I mean uh, the technology is uh, available for free as, as an app and it's actually integrated with Spotify already of course you can use it with your iTunes library on your phone but you can actually log in as a Spotify premium subscriber and uh, use it uh, that way as well and listen to the sort of equalized tracks that way but also uh, they have a big hardware play apparently where they're going to be implementing this on hardware devices I'm not sure whether they're going to make their own or whether they're going to implement it in third parties but uh, uh, that's essentially why they raise the money that's that's the play that they're making right now uh, you know it's it's an interesting concept and more and more people do have hearing problems uh, uh, hearing damage by cranking up uh, volume unnecessarily but do you see this taking off uh, uh, Elliot any thoughts on on uh, sound focus right now well, I love it. I, I reviewed this in last August. So these investors that just invested, they should start reading Evolver and then they can get a little earlier <laughs> on this thing. Um, but yeah, August 2013. Um, so the thing I liked about it is we all have hearing damage, everybody. Um, and, it's, and, we, and it's a lot worse than we think. Um, you know, people complaining about the sound quality of even CDs and our maximum hearing an adult, you know, we're down to like 14 kilohertz and instead of 20 that we think we have. Um, and, and we all have, all of our hearing loss is different. Um, yeah. The only people who don't have hearing loss live in the bush where there is no combustion engine and no electricity. And they find these guys that are 85, 90 years old and they have the hearing of a five-year-old American kid because they haven't been exposed to all this sound. So that's the starting point. All of our ears are messed up. We know that. Um, sound focus, the idea behind it is amazing, which is you identify the specific frequency range issues that your ears have and then do as much as you can uh, to the signal to try to work around those. You can't make yourself hear higher frequencies than your ears can hear, but if you have contours that are messed up, which you do, um, you know, if you drive your car at a certain speed all the time, you're going to have that frequency in your head all the time and you're, and you're going to lose that frequency before you lose other frequencies. So you, you don't want to, you can drive yourself crazy thinking about this stuff too much. Um, so I like what Sound Focus does. The version I tested in August, um, it only identified problems in three areas. So it's yeah. like you test your lows, your mids, and your highs. It's the same and now, they need to, is it? So they need to get a lot more specific before I'm going to buy that this is really going to help my the music sound better, you know, like a specific frequency, one little harmonic from the guitar, like I might be missing that band. And if they can give me some kind of filter sweep where I really am able to identify, I don't know how, but I'm really able to identify the exact frequencies that where I have problems um, and even, you know, more better contours than just three 
lows, mids, and highs, then then I'll really be impressed. Yeah, you're totally right. Because I mean, uh, now they have three uh, three uh, sort of um, frequency ranges that they allow you to check, and it doesn't doesn't feel like enough. Because if you're concerned enough about your hearing that you're gonna go down and download sound focus, I don't think you would mind to sit there through five, six, seven different uh, EQ bands because you're concerned about that problem. That's why you downloaded the app. And so I think as a first setup, somebody wouldn't mind spending an extra sort of 40, 50 seconds fiddling around with a few more frequencies than just three. Because uh, from I, I was quite chuffed. I was like, yay, uh, I don't have any hearing damage. It felt like, uh, you know, I had a pretty good, uh, I, I only had to raise one tap on each of the three categories and the EQ essentially remained flat for, for mm -hmm. the app. So uh, on my end, it sounded as if I had a really good hearing, although I have been in a metal band for four years and uh, I'm not sure that's <laughs> yeah. the case. <laughs> so. Oh man, I, yeah, we, I was in a band, you know, we're in the basement and everybody just yep. turns up and up and up and up and up. I mean, if the loudness war, that's where it starts, right? Yeah, exactly. The studio. Yeah. Jay, what are your thoughts on uh, on, on the sound focus? And uh, have, you, have you managed to try it out yet? Yeah, actually, what's really funny is I remember, Elliot, when, when this story came out last, I guess, like you said, last August. And what's funny is I didn't think it was the same company because when I heard about it, it was, a, it was pitching the concept of making it sound, improving the sound uh, of the iPod or, or, or the streaming generation. And so the first pass that I read it, I read it as a total music geek uh, and wanting my music, my digital music, because I don't really prefer digital music. I'm a vinyl guy. Yes, I'm that old. Um, it, it's that concept that I wanted my music to sound as best as possible. So I looked at it and I had the exact same research, that uh, re feedback that you guys did. I'm like, oh, there's only three little knobs? Okay, how's this really going to make an improvement? So I, I was like, ah, not, not for me, and I closed it down. So when this, when this message came out, or this, this article came out, and it talked about it's protecting ears, I went, oh, this is the same company. I literally had to look at the picture. I didn't remember the name of it, but here I'm looking at the picture of the, of the app, and I'm like, oh, that's the same one I tested last year. So it's interesting that now the focus is about, you know, it, is about saving and protecting the hearing, which I think, like you said, Elliot, it's like everyone's got hearing damage. I'm a drummer. God knows the damage that I did. And then on top of that, I had, a, I had an accident when I was a young boy, and I truly can only hear 25% on my right ear. So I'm screwed. It's like I can't hear to begin with, and yet I work – in the live music industry, a lot of times I still tour with some bands, and it's like, oh my gosh, you know, my hearing's probably terrible. So this this could be a great thing if they tweak it, like you guys said. If they can yeah. if they can evolve it to a point where it's more fine tuned, they can have their cake and eat it too. They literally can pitch it to most of the bands that I work with do use in ears for the for their stage monitors. So they're already worried about their hearing. Um, you know, they have these in ears that they they tweak to their own thing. Well, if you can go to those same exact people that are living with these ear monitors and say, hey, we can give you that same type of tweaking to your iPod or to your streaming service, I'm sure they jump on it. And then the back end, if you can say, hey, we'll protect your hearing by making sure that you're not too loud or doing over the other tweaks, I think, I think they can have it both ways. So I think it's a great tool. I just want to see more from it like we all agree on. Yeah, sure. And of course, uh, uh, an added reminder to anybody that's heading to uh, South by Southwest or uh, Miami Music Week or any live event soon that it is worth having a look at Amazon and ordering some uh, decent earplugs for live music because uh, normal earplugs that are made for flights or hotels are not uh, the best because they just cut off so much. And uh, not having earplugs at all, it's also pretty bad, as Elliot said. So, <laughs> <laughs> I would like to add. I would like to add one thing that earplugs don't make you invincible either. Oh, which sure. is how I made the mistake. I was like, oh, I have these these nice earplugs in. I'm going to stand right next to this 12-foot tall speaker <laughs> for an hour. <laughs> and like my Ouch. my shirt was moving. My shirt was flapping oh, from the base. Right. And I'm like, oh. I'm perfectly fine. I got my earplugs, got my earplugs. And then, you know, the next day, there's the tinnitus. Oh. I'm like, oh, well, that was obviously very stupid. So. Okay, yeah, that's, that's a very good piece of yeah. advice as well on top of that. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and I wanted to uh, talk briefly about the Brits, just uh, a yeah. quick follow-up from last week because we talked about uh, you know the UK music awards ceremony last week extensively in terms of the the Twitter amplify program and all of that good stuff but uh, we had some uh, of the TV ratings uh, this week uh, coming in and uh, it was the lowest uh, there were the lowest ratings in 15 years uh, uh, for the program with an average of 4.6 million viewers and this actually includes also the uh, ITV plus one which is sort of the the catch up an hour later channel for the same uh, TV station that was broadcasting them uh, uh, live uh, so this is a uh, uh, 
not a great news for the for the Brits, uh, but it did they did have a four times uh, almost four times more of uh, tweet mentions uh, uh, than last year. Uh, so over four million tweets uh, on the Brits. Uh, although half of those were actually driven by the Twitter voting contest, which was uh, uh, unsurprisingly won by One Direction. There was a special award uh, that was both voted from the audience on Twitter. So of course the band that has the most Twitter followers will get the award. It seemed pretty straightforward on that front. And uh, um, uh, figures on how many people live stream the show around the world on YouTube have not come in yet but the, those are gonna be quite interesting to see how many people actually decided to tune in from the States for example it was the middle of the afternoon there uh, and uh, and from other uh, other places around the world uh, guys of course I, I don't want you to comment on the Brits because uh, you know being from the US it's it's a difficult one but the Grammys over there have pulled uh, some decent ratings recently especially you know the ratings since have grown over the last uh, four or five years so what do you see as a factor there that has pushed the, the ratings uh, higher and and, uh, and why is that I, Honestly, I'll jump. Go for it. I'm going to jump in. I, th you know, I do. My reaction to the Brit story was one of you're dealing with, and one thing I always talk about in my classes, it's like you're dealing with trying to capture someone's attention in a increasingly over noisy world. So even though you know 2013 had great reviews or, or great numbers for the Brits, it's kind of like that's great, but a year later these people might have been really, really preoccupied and. Um, Therefore, their draw to go and sit in front of the TV or even or tape it on their DVR sometimes just happens. People forget. And I think we're also living in the world that I'm a perfect example of this. I missed. I was on the road with the band, and I missed the uh, in the states here. There was a Beatles tribute, and I frantically texted my wife, "Hey, don't forget to DVR the Beatles thing." And she had our three kids, and she and she's like, "Oh, I caught the last thirty minutes of it." So in my mind, I'm like, "You know what? Don't worry about it. I'll go seek it out online later." So I think we're almost in. We're kind of over the time because live broadcast has really become essentially convenient broadcast to most people if they can just capture or they'll seek it out later yeah. i think we're going to constantly see an eroding of actual viewership but like you just said it's like we don't know what the what the youtube or online viewership is yet for the brits so this might this might show a, a sea change in going that direction as far as the grammys goes it's actually ironic because we were talking about this in my class a couple weeks ago i think what we're looking at with the grammys is that in years past I think the industry has been very stale. I think it's been traditional, oh, usual, usual cast of characters, you know, biggest sellers are these kind of blockbuster people, longevity's there, they're coming from major labels. I think this year with Lord and with Macklemore in the, in the Grammys, I think what we're seeing in the States is very much an, indie, an independent focus. And those independent bands usually have rabid fan bases. And I'm not going to discredit One Direction and their millions and millions of, of you know, fans that they have. But... There, there's, there's that, and then there's this lower ground, which is the independent world. And the independent world has always been laborious in making sure that their voice is heard and supporting their artists. And it's definitely not as consumer-driven. It's much more fan-based driven. So I think the Grammys are looking at the reality that they've gotten smarter in looking at the bigger, um, a bigger playing field, if you will. And they're yeah. letting more of these independent artists come to the table and giving them awards that I think now if people are like, oh, wow. These people are nominated. I, I want to go and support them. I want, and I, I thought it was so amazing that Malcolm Moore has done so well, knowing that they truly were an indie, an indie focused band and a groundswell through some really smart independent focus. Same thing with the Civil Wars. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, full disclosure, I know that whole camp, and it's like the Civil Wars being nominated yet again and winning. It's like the, the, to me, it's the little guy proving that they can succeed in this business, yeah. and that's huge. Yeah. It's yeah. huge. Yeah. Sure, Elliot, on, on your end, what, what do you think about the Grammys? I had I have sort of a different take on it. I, I, to me, maybe it's just the people I know are highly obnoxious or something. Um, I didn't watch it. it uh, I usually don't. Um, it seemed to me that everybody I saw talking about it, the only reason they were watching it was to complain about it yeah. um, for some reason. <laughs> I, maybe I just know highly, I, I have highly obnoxious social yeah. yeah. Or I don't know, but it's like maybe it is because there's that mix of the indie stuff. So like you know maybe maybe indie people are finally expecting something from the Grammys, and now yeah. they're now they can be upset about the the big selling act that comes out. I don't know what it is, but to me that's a lot of the entertainment value. It seems like is this kind of snarky like um, I am you know 
a, a higher qualified music fan than whoever these Grammy people are making these awards. I mean, that yeah. seemed to me the underlying sentiment. And honestly, that's not really a bad thing for the Grammys. They're still the thing being talked about. Um, and, you know, to, to create a focal point of everybody's attention, even when it's people who don't like the thing, um, that's admirable on the face of it, I think. Yeah, sure. And uh, I wanted to close the show, actually, because I know that, uh, Jay, you have to go in, in just a few minutes. But I wanted yeah. to just touch upon uh, the wearables uh, side of things uh, and uh, do a complete leap from the usual digital music stories. But, uh, uh, of course, we've all been keeping an eye on what's going on in Barcelona at the uh, Mobile World Congress which has uh, definitely uh, become one of the bigger uh, electronics uh, uh, showcases in the world. I felt like it just generated almost more noise than CES uh, for some of the things that they're announcing. And so um, we have, we've seen a bunch of devices coming out. I'll just summarize really quickly. Samsung has, re the, uh, has released the Gear 2, which has an improved battery life and play, can play actually music uh, uh, stored on its 4GB uh, memory, so it has less dependency on, on the phone. Uh, it also released the Gear Fit, uh, a band device with a a lovely curved AMOLED screen with limited music functionality, but you can actually skip tracks during playback as, you, as you're running, for example. Uh, Huawei's uh, device is called the TalkBand, and it has an, a built-in uh, Bluetooth earpiece, which I guess could be used as an emergency earbud if you, if you had to, uh, but it doesn't have any specific music functionalities. Uh, there's the Sony SmartBand, which has much more ambitious plans to track all your media consumption habits to give you uh, a live journal of sorts, but you have to go through the Sony app uh, uh, on Android right now and log all that stuff through that, because the uh, device doesn't have a screen so it's it's a war essentially there's a massive you know war of wearables going on and uh, somebody wants to come on top but it feels like everybody's providing slightly different functionalities there's not very much focus on content or content consumption and uh, so do you feel like my big question overarching question around this is do you feel like there is space for one player that has really nailed and can really nail the content consumption side of things whether it's apple or google to come in with a device that can really facilitate that and uh, and and you know, win the market, at least win a, a, a majority of the market uh, compared to, you know, the co complete fragmentation that we're finding uh, today in, uh, at, the, at the Congress. So uh, I don't know if anybody wants to take this one. It's, it's kind of an open-ended question, but Elliot, I don't know if you have any thoughts on wearables and how they can integrate with content today. First, yeah, I do. Um, the thing I love about it is that it's not about staring at a screen. So all I, I stare at a screen all the time, and then I walk around, and I'm staring at a screen as much as possible, and then it's nighttime, and I'm trying to look at another screen, um, and it's just a lot of screens. And so what I like about this is, you know, just the simple fact of putting controls on your wrist for your music player, um, that obviates the need to, like, I mean, it's just, music apps are in the way, or, or smartphones are in the way of apps, is what I've been saying. So, like, if I want to switch a song, i got to tap my phone, like, eight times, whereas <laughs> my old CD player, I pick up the remote, and I'm like, bip, and it's done. Um, so I think we need to actually catch up to the past in that regard and not always have to go into a complicated screen menu every time we want to do something. Right. Um, it goes for inputs, outputs. I mean, if they can, you know, look at my heart rate and pick a song, then great. The less I have to look at the screen, you know, I'm all for it. Yeah. Um, the other thing is I think it, that something's going to take over in this area, and I hope that it's a protocol or a platform or two platforms forms rather than one device because yeah. um the w when it'll really get interesting is just the degree of specialization like you know like you said that that one device that has bluetooth in one headphone but it's not for music people well there should be something else that's the same that has both the headphones and um and there, the amount of variety is going to make the the smartphone variety look ridiculous yeah i mean because once you're just putting sensors on your body or in your house Oh, and buttons. I mean, I want a, I want like a like button on my wall and somebody's <laughs> going to build it and it's going to have an audio fingerprint and I'm just gonna be like, bing, yeah. I like that. And, and uh, there's no phone, there's no computer. So um, I think it's got to be a platform. And, and of course, if you're Apple or Google, you want there to be one device and you want to own it. So we'll Absolutely. see what happens. Absolutely. And Jay, the last word to you uh, on, on this uh, area. Uh, what are you excited about when it comes to content consumption and the wearable devices? Well, I think, I think it, it kind of meets, it meets people where they're where they're going to be, and I, Elliot, I actually I, I totally agree with what you're saying. It's like, man, one thing that I, I have an issue with, and I still use my iPod all the time, is because it's simplistic. I press a button, I have music. When I'm on my phone, I do have to open up the screen, go into this app, do that, and it just becomes cumbersome, and it's not safe when I'm driving. Um, I, I just want to have kind of a non-existing thing, or when I run. Um, I still run with my iPod solely for that because I punch in I punch in something and I go. I don't have to work. I don't have to look at the screen. I don't have to think about it. So if I think 
you know, the wearable concept is brilliant. I think as, as active as people are and you hit the nail on the head too, Elliot, it's like all day I'm sitting in front of my computer or I'm on my phone. If I can break away from those, let me break away from them and truly get out there. And if you can give me content fed to that thing where I don't have to worry about more things, great, bring it on. And I do think it would be awesome to have uh, the levels of, of kind of products that are aimed towards the music consumer or, or towards this or towards this and let these companies battle it out. But I, sure, I actually hope that there's not just one product because then, then we're screwed. I want to see innovation over just like the smartphones have a ton of innovation now. Yeah. But they're, they're, there's definitely still pros and cons to each platform. But you know, I, I think will there be a, a clear winner? Probably not for a good while. I mean, I think I think it's going to take an, a couple of years of adapt, adapting into the lifestyle of how these things can be used. But smart marketers, all these companies have tons and tons of dollars, and they will market the crap out of the stuff. So people <laughs> and consumers, they'll know what these things are for, and they'll go, oh, maybe I'll give that a try. So I'm sure this Christmas, everybody and their mother will be asking for a wearable device because it'll be marketed to death, which is yeah. fine. I mean, I, I don't have a problem with that. Um, as long as you do kind of separate it from the smartphone and separate it from all these other things and focus on the fact that you can break away with a wearable. Yeah, sure. Well, uh, that was a good note to end on. And guys, uh, thank you so much for joining me today. It was a uh, really good fun. And as usual, we didn't manage to uh, cover everything. We had a couple of stories that I had to leave behind, uh, which is band pages deal with iHeartRadio and also Dave Allen uh, moving to Beats. Uh, he's been a guest on the show for a few times, uh, but uh, uh, two things that uh, you can definitely read up on in the show notes or that uh, we might be able to cover next week. So uh, thank you so much, Jay. Your website is? It's uh, musicgeekservices.com. Perfect. And also we can find you on Twitter. Uh, the handle is? It's Music Geek Management, and the management is MGMT. Perfect. So Music Geek Management. Yeah. Thank you cool. so much. And Elliot, uh, thank you so much as well. Uh, the website is evolver.fm, of course. Uh, anything else that you want to plug your end? Um, I guess I always say that uh, my brother's in this band, Javelin, and everybody should check it Absolutely. out. Absolutely. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and Jay, awesome. Jay, nice to meet you, Jay, as well. Nice and, uh, to meet you, I'm Elliot. glad that you enjoyed the Grammys. I hope I didn't come off obnoxious on that. Oh, no, no. Because <laughs> I didn't even watch it. I didn't even watch it. So no, no, no. What, but, I have no but, right. Uh, anyway. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of my job to watch it because uh, it's. I need to know what's going on to then talk about it to my students. So of course, no worries. No worries. And uh, thanks so much for listening to Digital Music Trends. Uh, the show comes out every week, and uh, uh, next week is going to be the last uh, normal show uh, for a couple of weeks because uh, then I'm going to be heading off to South by Southwest, and there's going to be lots and lots of coverage from Austin. So uh, visit digitalmusictrends.com for more information. You can also find the Medium playlist of all my interviews I've done on Medium on YouTube com slash digital music trends and thanks so much for listening again have a fantastic week and until next time 